Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Jakarta Tech Talk. My name is Serena, and joining us today is Rustam, who will be presenting five tips to make your Java apps more awesome. If you have any questions for Rustam as we move through today's presentation, feel free to ask them in the chat or use the Ask a Questions tab. Rustam, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'm very happy to, to be with you all today. I, uh, I'm joining you all from Oslo, Norway, and uh, feel free to use the chats to write where you are from and uh, write your questions and uh, everything uh, while I am uh, presenting this, and then we'll, we'll do that all at the end. Um, it's always great to be here. It's always great to uh, be uh, at, at the stream with all of you. And uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what makes a typical Java application awesome. And it's like, it's a very, um, it's not very specific or very kind of a scientific thing, like calling something for awesome because you can't really measure it. But, you know, I want to give you at least five tips that will, I think will make your applications better. And you don't need to do all those five things at the same time. And you can do it maybe one, maybe two, maybe all of them. It's up to you. And also, I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, these things that I'm going to be mentioning, there will be something that will differentiate your applications from uh, the way we used to do applications, the way we used to create our applications back in the days. And we've been doing, we've been writing Java uh, code and Java applications for, well, what now? Uh, almost 30 years now. So it's getting, uh, it's it's 20 years, uh, 29 years anniversary. We just had it uh, uh, recently. And so, yeah, I mean, 30 years of code, it's not really, now, uh, the way we do it now, it's not exactly the same way we used to do it before. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and what makes it, the, the differentiates it from the old way of doing that. Um, my name is uh, Rustam. I'm a, a Java champion. I am also the Google Cloud, uh, Google developer experts for cloud. And uh, I, am, uh, I work mostly with uh, development, Java applications, architecture, uh, cloud native applications and things like that uh, on uh, on a daily basis. So this is a little bit of a mix of things that I would like to share with you today. So before that, I will start. I would like to start with a little bit of introduction for, for the topic. I did mention a few things, but I want to go a little bit more into the depth, and I want to focus also uh, on uh, Jakarta EE and some other things as well. And uh, We've known, I usually, when we do it live, when we do this kind of presentations live, I usually ask people how many people have heard of Jakarta EE, and then there will be some hands, and then I would ask them, like, okay, have you heard of Java EE, Java J2EE, and all the other names that uh, that thing used to have? And there will be more hands, usually different hands. And so what I usually end up saying is that, well, you know, you all of you that raised hands to any of those questions could have raised your hand for any other of the questions as well, because it used to be called uh, one thing, and it did change its name, as you can see here on the uh, timeline, a bit like a, 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 a timeline with versions and uh, features that has been added to it. And as you can see, it, it started as J2EE, became Java EE, uh, and then uh, at some point it became Jakarta EE, and, and so on, so on. And this is also uh, things that has been added uh, to it as well. And uh, generally, it's been a collection of libraries and, and things and features and functionality that's been added that will make your applications more enterprise ready. So it used to be called Enterprise Edition and all this kind of stuff. And uh, we'll see what it is, what it means today. So we're right now I'm focusing on Jakarta 10. Well, 11 is just around the corner and all this kind of stuff. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, for now about the 10 and uh, focus on, on those features there. Um, so what has been done uh, during the one of the last releases is that it's been separated into different profiles, right? So you have Jakarta 10, uh, EE 10 platform, that is the whole thing that you see here. Uh, then we have a little bit smaller subset of this uh, features, as you can see. Uh, probably you can't see all of them. Maybe you can see it if you if you if you you know look a little bit closer. But that's done on purpose because we do, we're not going to talk about all the other things that are grayed out here. But there are a bunch of things like you know working with emails or like you know 
you know, uh, mail and messaging and uh, what serverless uh, faces, persistence, all those kind of things that we're not going to be talking that much about. That was the whole JocRD platform. But then you have a, a web profile, which is a smaller subset. And then at the end, we have also a core profile, which is even smaller uh, subset, where we have things like uh, you know JSON bindings and RESTful web services and um, uh, CDI, so dependency injection, and all those kind of things. Um, those core profile things is the ones that you really need for uh, most of the times you will at least need for the uh, for the um, cloud native applications when you're developing those because uh, you don't really need all the other things and pull them all and create a big footprint for your application. You would like to uh, keep your microservices and cloud native applications kind of neat and small and, and uh, footprint wise and memory wise and all these kind of things and, and uh, use them, put them in these tiny little containers. And so you kind of throw away all the other things and you keep all those things that you really need for your uh, modern and uh, nowadays uh, cloud native applications. Um, what I'm going to mention as well is some features that are coming on top of uh, Jakarta EE. So as you can see, the, the box that you see at the bottom there, it's uh, Jakarta EE 10 core profile, yellow box there. And on top of that, there are a few other things that do add more uh, functionality that you might need for your microservices. So cloud native applications typically are something related with uh, microservices or microservice architecture kind of things. And uh, also, it, it uses other services as well. So we would like to have things like uh, REST client, for instance, so we can actually talk to other REST services without being, uh, being uh, forced to write uh, things like our own REST uh, HTTP calls and parsing of JSON and all those kind of things. So you can actually just use the REST client to find them, uh, the the objects, how they look, and everything will kind of magically happen and be uh, converted to to uh, to a Java objects. And then we have things like health and metrics and fault tolerance and you know all those kind of things. We'll talk more about that, and we'll be focusing on the things that you see on the left side of your screen. Uh, we're not going to be talking about the standalone uh, thing that is outside the umbrella. It's really nice features and cool stuff, but we're not going to be talking about this today. Uh, we'll be focusing on, 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 on the left side, mostly. Um, the thing is that all of this that we've been talking about, both uh, Jakarta and MicroProfile and all that, they're all specifications. So this is a specification. It's up to uh, providers of those to actually to, 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 to implement those and to uh, tell uh, and verify that they actually do comply with those specifications as well. Um, so what you will see is you will see uh, several different implementations uh, for those specifications, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but you know, it's worth mentioning that that it's it's a kind of difference. It's there are reference implementations, but all in all, to begin with, to to to, to at, at the bottom of it, it's actually a specification. Okay. Um, what is a typical uh, scenario for the modern Java applications? In modern Java applications, usually would use some kind of uh, other third-party providers. Um, you know, it could be something like um, payment APIs, right? You have a solution that does some kind of you need to your customers to pay for something, and then you're integrating with another API that does all the payments, or you're integrating with something to pro to get more data to. To, to, to get and receive and, and, and submit some data to other services. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to uh, have a fault tolerance. Because uh, most of the times when we would create monoliths back in the days, uh, we, would, we would not be forced to think too much about this. Because everything would be inside that monolith. And maybe there will be also a payment module and all the other things. And everything would be kind of connected much tighter. And uh, if one thing would fail, everything else would fail. And you know you didn't really need to think too much of the fault tolerance. You probably should have done that. But often, oftentimes, you would see this kind of thing that it wasn't. What it actually means, the fault tolerance? Well, 
what if something that you rely on fails, right? That's what it means. But it also means that it can be something that you rely on uh, externally or internally. We've seen a lot of uh, post-mortems and, and issues with uh, systems going down internally, taking itself down because something uh, within the um, a, a ecosystem or you know a, a network of the system goes down and all the other um, uh, parts of the application will start pinging that thing. Uh, they will see that the, there is nothing to, to, no replies or anything. They will end up DDoSing its own application, saturating network and creating more uh, trouble than it actually was to begin with. So we really want to be able to gracefully fail if something happens. And of course you can do, add that feature yourself. You can implement it yourself and everything, but maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't want to, you can use uh, already existing uh, um, um, solutions for that. Like I said, I mean, I started with the introduction of uh, Jakarta E. I also mentioned micro profile and stuff. And this is the examples that I will be showing based on that stack. But if you're developing Java applications based on other uh, other stacks, other platforms, whatever that might be, Spring Boot, all the other things, you will be able to find similar features. So the features are not really tied to a, a specific uh, library or something like that. But I will be using uh, some libraries to show you the actual examples of it, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about why do we want to do that, right? Why do we need fault tolerance? I mean. What's wrong with that? Well, you know, your application should be able to handle something else failing, right? Um, if, let's say, you have that application that is using uh, payment APIs or some transaction stuff, and that payment thing is down, you should be able still to uh, operate uh, and just maybe show an, some kind of error to, to users saying, hey, you know what, the payment is down, but everything is working else, so please feel free to use uh, the everything else and we'll come back and let you know when the payment part is up instead of going full uh, black screen or whatever the, the error message uh, 500 errors and all this kind of stuff to the user so you want to be able to gracefully kind of avoid uh, situations when something fails that you rely on but still operate so you know you have a set of microservices, you have a set of cloud native applications, it could be serverless applications, it could be applications running on Kubernetes, it could be uh, running on prem on something else, but it doesn't matter. The point is that now we have much more uh, loose dependencies from between those applications, and we should be able to handle those uh, going down. Um, another thing that is really nice, uh, that nice feature and also something that you should expect from a solution that provides a fault tolerance is to be able to switch to a backup solution. So you should have a failover as well. And uh, yeah, so, and then you should be able to also provide exponential backoffs and things like that. So, you know, if something fails, you can actually uh, gradually and gracefully start asking less and less and less about that thing being up because, you know, okay, we've well, tried 10 times, it's still not up. There is no reason for asking about it 100 times a second. I'll back off for three seconds and I'll wait. The next time I'll back off for nine seconds and, and so on and so on. So do a kind of exponential back offs as well. So that's another feature that you would typically want to expect in your uh, whatever is provided this fault tolerance thing. Uh, when it comes to uh, micro profile, which is Part of uh, a part of Eclipse uh, Foundation and Eclipse uh, the umbrella. It here we have a few things, right? And most of those things in in uh, similar to Jakarta E stuff. It's usually just annotations, so you can just add an annotation and uh, cre create and add information for each call and each uh, information, right? Uh, each uh, methods that you're providing. So you can provide things like timeout, you can provide a, a strategy for retries, you can provide a fallback function, you can provide circuit breakers and, you know, all these kind of things. Uh, again, like I said, this is a set of specifications It will be implemented by providers, but the actual spec is uh, the one you can see the tiny little link you can see at the bottom there that will bring you to 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 the actual spec for those features and explanation of how it works and what to expect from uh, this. 
Uh, when it comes to code, I will show you live code in a little bit. But for now, I'm just showing you some screenshots just to do uh, to go kind of a little bit quickly through it. So here we can see that uh, uh, we're uh, registering a REST client that will be providing some kind of information from a another endpoint at localhost 8080. Uh, that endpoint is uh, uh, have a URL at uh, that responds to slash API. And there we will see two different uh, methods, uh, so endpoints, right? Uh, there will be a, a message endpoint and there will be a message backup endpoint. And what I've done is that I created those two endpoints in different service. I'll show you the architecture and stuff afterwards. But imagine that message endpoint is much more correct or rich in features and stuff like that, but it's it's a little bit unstable. So what I've done, what you will see in a bit is that I, I basically created a randomness in that function. And every so and so often, I would basically uh, uh, use a, a kind of a, a game um, dice. I will, I'll, I'll cast the dice. And every time uh, the number that I get between 1 and 6 is divisible by 2, I would just fail. So just to introduce some randomness to that function. And if that is failing, I can actually provide a failover method that is called message backup that will actually respond to, to that as well. And that is really nice, because then you can actually do things like uh, this. So your, your external service looking like this, right? Like I told you, you do a roll of a, uh, you roll a dice. And if it's divisible by 2, it's a success. And if it's not divisible by 2, it just fails. And, um, and backup will always return something, but it will just tell you a backup, hello. So that's my uh, endpoints, right? So this is where I use them. And this is where I'm actually uh, defining the endpoints, so two different services. And, and you can actually create a backup, uh, as you can see here. I'm creating an at fallback and, and defining my uh, fallback method. That means that if message fails, it will automatically call that other data method and just uh, get the data from there. So you will see if you keep on refreshing that, we'll see that in a bit. But if you keep on refreshing that, you'll see uh, it will say, you know, hello there, hello there, hello there. And all of a sudden, it will say, oh, a backup hello. And then we'll be back to the hello there and so on and so on because of the randomness. Um, so failover, we've talked a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about help. So that's another thing that you really want to, uh, for your cloud native applications to be uh, able to expose uh, their health. And what do I mean by health? Well, you know, it's a way of measuring uh, temperature or measuring how your application is doing. So what is happening inside your application? How do you do that? Well, um, and why do you need that, right? Why do you need that? Well, I have a very, very horrible uh, wordplay here that I'm kind of proud of, but not very proud of, or very proud of and very not proud of. I don't know. Uh, up to you. But it's basically what's up, up. Yeah, I know it's, it's bad, but you know it's, I couldn't help myself. Uh, but the thing is that you really want to be able to actually check how is your app is doing and check what's up uh, with your app. Because if your app is running on some kind of uh, modern infrastructure, things like Kubernetes, things like serverless applications, stuff like that, you want to be able to provide automatic and standardized uh, probes to your application telling how is it doing? And there can be several things. Like one of them is like the obvious one is like, hey, are you are you awake? Are you actually uh, able to serve some traffic at all? Are you are, is the application up and running? It's not hanging and all these kind of things. That's one. The other thing is that you would like actually to to have readiness probes and 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 uh, all these kind of things to make sure that your container is up and running, your application is up and running, uh, it's healthy, and all these kind of things as well. We'll look at that in a second as well. Here it is. So we have readiness probe, we have startup probe, and we have liveness probe. So liveness, well, are you alive, right? Uh, startup uh, probe uh, is uh, basically uh, have you started up, but readiness is more about are you able to actually do what you're supposed to do? Okay, fine, your container is up and running, but is it able to 
do what the app is supposed to do. Usually the readiness probe is, would be something that uh, all those platforms that I mentioned, like serverless platforms or Kubernetes and all these kind of things, would use the readiness probe to actually know if the application is ready, up and ready, and it's, it's able or it should start serving traffic to it as well. Um, so, um, and again, this is uh, implementation of MicroProfile Health, but you should be able to expect something like that from anything else that you might be using. Maybe it's not going to be annotations, but it's still going to be the same kind of probes, and it's still going to be the same kind of standard, and it's, the standard is very simple. It's either it returns up or down, and it will tell you, uh, it will have a, 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 a specific structure, like a slash health, slash health ready, slash health startup, and so on. We'll see that in a bit as well. Um, another thing, okay, I'll show, I'll go through all of those uh, things, and then we can uh, look at, 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 at the live code uh, afterwards. So, um, actually, let's, let's do the scary part. Let's try to, to do this. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. We want to have everything up and running. Good. It seems like it's actually even healthy and all this. That's good. We can go to... Um, mm, let's see, we can go here. I want to show you a little bit of readiness stuff. Resource not found. Perfect. So that is good. What's wrong with this? Why it's not up and running? Um, let's see. Docker PS. Yeah, you're up and running. 19. Oh, yeah, I know why. That's being me being stupid. I have. No, it's not. Okay, let's see. That's fun. Um, technically, I should be able to go here. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, OK, good. Um, so I have a service running at 9081, and I have a health checks for it, and I have different checks. Like I have two liveness checks. I have one readiness check and one uh, startup check. So I know that the application started. I know that the backend, for example, connection is OK. And I also know that it's like self-health checks, like you know, it's responding with the correct HTTP response code. It response time is OK, and so on. So I created a bunch of cu custom stuff. And I can actually even go only for liveness or readiness or startup probes. As you can see here, I can go to slash ready, slash live, or start started. Uh, let's see like this, slash live, it will give me only liveness probes, and so on. Started, and so on. And this is really nice, because this kind of things, I will be able to uh, actually get from, um, I will be able to use that to get this information and use it for Kubernetes and stuff like that. Um, let's see if I can do. Yeah, there you go. So remember I told you about the failover thing? For now, it will always return hello there because I have not turned on this um, uh, randomness of failing. So we'll get back to that in a second. I just wanted to give you a little bit of taste and actually show you that things works. And it's really fun to do this because you're doing live demo. You have actually Docker containers running and uh, Docker Compose and all this. And there is like what can possibly go right sometimes, you know, demo gods and all this kind of thing. So it's always fun and a little bit exciting. Uh, but, you know, I, I try to keep my demos not too exciting with that kind of thing. I mean, it's exciting to show you features, but it's not exciting to like, okay, will it work? Will it work? Anyway, let's go uh, further. Let's talk a little bit about metrics. So. Now we, we have created an application that is able to tolerate errors when they happen, if they happen. Um, we've created an application that is able to tell the platform it's running, how it's doing, how the health is, uh, how it feels today, you know, how it's, if it's healthy and stuff. And now we want to provide even more information. Now we want to provide uh, also some kind of metrics, uh, more information to platform 
to some kind of telemetry applications or platforms that you're using uh, to tell how things are going on in uh, inside your container. And why do you want to do that? Well, you want to do that to be able to provide some kind of custom metrics, but there is also some out-of-the-box metrics as well. So sometimes it's enough just to show, provide whatever is out there by default. Sometimes you would like to create some kind of custom metrics. For example, you want to measure a number of calls to a specific endpoint, or you want to measure a number of times that specific unstable endpoint keeps on failing, and you want to know how many times it has failed, or you know anything Anything you can pretty much think of, anything that you can convert to a piece of code can be that custom metric. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, you want to measure custom parameters, you want to uh, uh, create something that is very specific to your application, and you want to expose that to be used by others. Uh, for example, like I said, uh, some kind of things like Prometheus or something like that that will actually uh, collect that metrics and, and we'll be able to show them over time. It can be a load to CPU and th stuff. You know, anything really that you can think of, you can do this kind of stuff with, right? Um, the simplest stuff you can do, uh, simplest stuff you can uh, always do is to count things, right? So obviously you can do that here. You can do at counted and then you tell, okay, if that's an absolute, a number or not, and uh, what kind of tags do you want to provide, and then you just keep on uh, creating this value. And the fun thing is that you can actually do the same tags and all that for different methods with the same name, and it will still uh, be able to do all these kind of things. And sometimes you can uh, add different tags to it, and it will actually show up with different tags. So you can actually use this to, 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 to extract some useful information from your running application. Because now your application is running inside a container, inside a, a Kubernetes node, inside a, somewhere on the cloud, somewhere you have no idea how to look into. But with this kind of things, it will give you a bit more information about it. And since we're here, we can actually do a get request to slash metrics and see how it's going. So let's see what happens if we change this to uh, metrics. And drum roll, ooh, and we actually have something. Let's make it a bit smaller so you can actually read it a bit easier. Um, so yeah, this is all default stuff. But if I go to uh, 1982, which is a different service, uh, different endpoint, so backend endpoint. I'll, I'll explain what it is, but for now, just think of it. There are two different endpoints. One is 1981, and the other one is 1982 ports, right? So this is another one. And the reason I'm going here is that I wanted to show you the uh, custom uh, metrics that I've created. So this is a, a message uh, a counter. And for now, I see that it's been called 22 times and zero failures, which makes sense. So if you go to localhost uh, message uh, 1981, uh, sorry, hi. There you go. So now I run the hi, and that hi actually calls the message at the, at, at, at the other one. And we should see, instead of 22, we should be seeing 23 here now. And, and we do. So if we refresh it twice more, it should be 25. So actually, counting works. Uh, and zero failures, right, for now. All right, let's go back. Um, let's go slideshow. Good. OK, so again, it's a spec. Uh, spec is, uh, you can find the link to the specification down there as well. And this is all using Jakarta on, 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 uh, below. And then we have some extra stuff on top of that, that that provides that extra information that is very useful for your uh, cloud native applications. And by cloud native, it's also very important to mention cloud native does not mean that it has to run on the cloud. It can run on prem, it can run on your VM, it can be the, everything like that. But it is, Cloud native that means that it is able to, or it's it's 
it's easier or it's more uh, made to be run on cloud or serverless applications and using this kind of uh, uh, um, distributed architecture, if you want. Uh, and if you really want to know what it is, I do have it in different other talks, but I didn't put it in here. But there is a definition. There is an official cloud, CNCF, so Cloud Native Computing Foundation. They have an official definition of what cloud native is. So you can uh, look for it, and you'll see a little uh, uh, piece of text that actually explains it. Another thing that I would like to talk about, which is not Jakarta, which is not Microfile, which is not anything, but it's very, very useful for your application, is uh, something called feature toggling. And the reason, actually, that it's uh, that we were not able to recreate the errors so far is that I have actually a feature uh, which is called, I think it's called Chaos. And that chaos feature is not existing there yet. It's not turned on yet. And that's why my code never fails. Um, what is feature toggling? Well, technically, feature toggling could have been a uh, if or a config file, a config variable in a config file, or something like that that will actually tell you, like, you know, if that exists, if that is set to something, do something else. But you don't want to really code those things yourself, and you don't really want to create those features yourself, and you don't really want to put them in the config files because it's really hard to refresh config files, to re read that information. Very often, you will need to restart your application to read the, the value of config files, and so on, so on, so on. There are solutions for that. One of them I'll be showing you is, uh, is, uh, is well, I'll show you in a second, but it's, it, I'll show you one of them. There are a bunch of others. Uh, you, I'm not going to sell you a specific solution. I'm going to sell you the idea, and then it's up to you to p figure out which one do you want to use. Do you want to use a paid version, a free version, open source version, uh, anything else of those different different solutions that are out there? What it's good for in general, it well, it will let you turn on and off features kind of magically in a in a in, in a UI where you just go on off on off, and it will just uh, do it for you in some kind of magic. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that magic, but you know, different solutions will be doing it a tiny little bit different. What you can also use it for to do things like gradual releases. For example, you can say, you know what? For all the people with the geographical location of IP addresses of this countries, uh, release this feature to them. And so like, all the people from Norway get this feature, or all the people from Norway do not get this feature. Everybody else in the world will get that, but people in Norway will not because, I don't know, because regulations, because uh, we're not ready to, do, to deliver that feature in that country. Or it can be something else. It can be A-B testing. You can do like, OK, show this feature to half of the people. The other half don't need to show, to show it yet. Show the old interface or old features. And it, it can give you an ability to do all these kind of fun things and very control that very easily. It also uh, lets you turn off uh, partially implemented features. So instead of just, uh, let's say you have a front end and you have back end. Your uh, back end team is done implementing it. Or no, actually, let's do it the other way. You have front end and back end. Your front end uh, people have implemented it ready. Everything is done. Backend people are a bit slow, and they're not done with their stuff. Instead of removing and kind of removing everything from the uh, code base uh, of your application and like rewriting the front end and all this, you, what you could have done is just to create a feature and hide the whole uh, you know, piece of whatever that is in the front end until the back end is ready. When it's done, you just to toggle it on, and magically it just appears. And you don't even have to redeploy uh, a front-end application again. You just turn it on, and it's on. Uh, so there is one important thing, though. Uh, OK, we'll talk about, about that in a second. But for now, let's talk a bit about how. Well, like I said, you can, can obviously do it by hand. It, technically, you could just create a bunch of ifs and elses and all this kind of stuff and do it yourself. You don't really want to do that because it's a kind of tedious job, and you need to implement those everywhere, and you need to think of all the places, and you need to keep track of all that. Let another solution do that for you. 
and uh, you don't want to put it in a config file. We talked a little bit about that as well. So it's a good idea to use a tool. The tool I will be showing off here is something called Unleash. The reason I'm showing it, well, they're kind of twofold. One of them is that they have a they are open source. They have a, a free version that you can just download, clone, and run. And so I don't really have to advertise for anything that will cost you money. And uh, the other thing is that, well, I mean, they do have managed service and stuff if you want to, but that's not, I'm not going there at all. Uh, and the other reason is that it's uh, it's also made in Norway. So it's kind of a bit cool thing to just show off some 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 uh, some stuff that's been made here as well. But, you know, it's, it's a bit more of a curiosity than maybe a, a, a real reason for showing you things. And I needed an example. I needed to land on something, so I picked that one. There are a bunch of others. So pick one, see if it works for you. If not, try another one, see if that works for you, and so on, so on. Keep going until you're happy. Oh, important thing, very important thing before I go any further. It's super important. I cannot underline how important that is. It is to clean up your features after you're done with them. If you don't have a use for a feature, if you, for example, release that backend thing, you turned on the front end thing, you will never be turning off that feature again on your front end. Do remove the feature toggling thingy in the front end in the next release because users will not see it, but developers will do see it and they will see the difference because if that feature stays there over time, at some point in time in like, I don't know, six months, one year, two years, 10 years, they will have no idea if that feature is in use anymore or not. And it's going to be very, very, very hard to figure out if that should have been deleted or not. And at some point, it becomes this uh, kind of holy feature that nobody dares to touch. And it's just there, and it becomes a uh, legacy, and it becomes a uh, technical uh, depth, and it becomes a headache. And yeah, you know, do please do clean up all your features or your feature toggles should have an expiry date. Put that into docs, into commit files, into uh, comments, anywhere. Just make sure it's actually being deleted. You know, this this feature will, with this feature toggle will self-destruct in whatever time, right? So the way you do that is that, and that's the reason why. Oops, and that's the reason why uh, my uh, failing service did not fail is that I have a feature toggle. And uh, the way I'm actually getting hold of this, I just say basically unleash dot is enabled, and then I provide a name of it. And then if if it is uh, if it is there, it will uh, do one thing, and if it's not there, it will do another thing. For example, right in this case. And the way you control it, you basically do it from the UI. Let's see if we can do it real quick. Uh, let's see my documentation. So uh, now I think it's about time to show you a little bit of my fancy architecture. And as an as an totally uh, nerd and geek that I am, I, I actually created an architecture for my uh, web services in ASCII because you know as you do because why not? So we have a front end service uh, called Demo Service One, and we have a back end service that that service is using called Demo Backend Service One. So service A, service B, it has endpoints, high and feature. So you've seen high, and then we can probably have a look at feature. Feature? Yeah, it says it's a bug. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a bug. It's, it's not a bug, it's a feature kind of thing. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm going for. And uh, on, on, the, on, on the back end, uh, we have same thing. We have another high. We have another feature. But we also have this message and backup message, right? So we're on 1982. And then that means that we can actually access directly a message. And it should be under API. There you go. So this is message and backup. Back message uh, yeah okay message is there good oh I think I know why no it's not okay anyway we'll get we'll get to that we'll see why uh, in a bit uh, all right, let's see uh, what do we want to do. Okay, we now we have another service, which is the feature toggling service. And we have this certain toggles here, feature, chaos, and delay. 
delay we'll use a little bit later for the liveness probes and stuff like that. Maybe if we have time. Uh, but chaos and feature is the ones that are kind of interesting. Uh, let's see. So what we can do is we go to um, we'll go to a uh, unleash service, which is let me see. It's here. Okay. Right. And by the way, all this code that you're actually seeing here is uh, is uh, it's in uh, it's available online, and it's available on my GitHub repository. So you can actually easily go and have a look at how things look uh, there. And I'll show you the link, and I'll I'll share the link with you in a bit, and as well. Um, so unleash, it's here. Uh, the username is, of course, admin. And uh, one of the things you should do is to change your username and password. This is a local service, so I don't really need. It's not a big issue that it is a default service. It's going to go down, and it's not available on the internet. But still, uh, do not do that kind of stuff. Uh, what I want to do, I create a new feature toggle. I want to call it uh, chaos, chaos. Create feature toggle, and I want to create another one called feature. Um, feature. Good. Now I have two different feature, uh, two different things, right? So I can turn on a feature in development, and that also means that we should be able to say feature. And now, you see what happened? Now it's a feature. Because if I turn it off, it might take a little bit of time. It takes usually a few, just a few seconds. And at some point, it becomes a bug. So now I'm refreshing and says it's a bug. I toggle that feature on back on again. And it, it will become a feature. It depends. Like, you know, usually it takes within a few, less than a, a second or two, it will create, a, it will update itself. So with the way it works, there is a, a, a feature toggling service that will be propagating those features to all the, the listeners to, of that service. Um, I want to show you a little bit of this message thing, right? So if you go to hi, it will go, you always say hello there. I want to create a bit of a chaos, so I turn that thing on. At some point, we'll start seeing errors here. Come on. It's a bit of randomness, so we'll need to. Oh, yeah, there was one. Uh, yeah, there's one. A backup hello. So now service failed. And I've seen it twice, I think, for now. First time it was a bit too quick. This is the second time. So if we go to slash um, uh, metrics, we should have two failovers. You see, I'm zooming in. Purpose failover, and it's two of them. And it's 75 successes uh, and two errors. So we can actually measure this kind of stuff as well. And now I am having a bit fun. So now it's three times, four times, five times. I think if I count it correctly. Yeah, well, nine uh, plus. Yeah, OK, that makes sense, right? Because we had two to begin with. All right, so that's the feature toggling. So you can actually start feature toggling stuff. And then you can also, I can create another feature. Go away, new feature. Uh, which is delay, and we'll see that also. That's kind of fun because create feature. So, um, um, so now we have a, something called delay, and I'll explain why. Because if we go to um, um, health. We see that everything is up and running. But I do have a response time check here. And I do check if it is longer than a specific uh, number of milliseconds, it will fail if it is too slow. So the moment I turn on this delay, the service will become slow because I put a little bit of sleep in the code if that feature is on. So now should the feature should be on while I'm talking. So if I refresh, you see that the, the, the refresh is not done. The thing is spinning. 
And now we are actually getting a liveness uh, error saying critical service high or slash high is too slow. So now we are actually down. So now I'm already telling everybody that is running uh, and listening to slash health that my service is down and it needs to be done something. So typically to Kubernetes and all the others would mean kill the, po uh, kill the service, redeploy container again and see if it gets better. All right, and then I can actually sort by liveness. Again, it takes a bit, it's much slower now because now I'm waiting for a response. And well, it's too slow. Uh -huh. Cool. Okay. Well, you know, we turn off the delay. We we'll wait a little bit, and we should be back and live and running in a second. It's up. Everything is good now, right? So you can see that you can create custom tests and you can create custom messages, and but you still provide the status that is the most machine readable thing that you will be doing here, and the name and all this text and description stuff. It's up to you. It's for human consumption, really. Okay, let's go into one last thing and then we can do the questions and all this. So we talked about feature toggling, right? So again, use something that does the feature toggling, but it will really, really help your application to, to make it a little bit better, make it a little bit more agile in a way. Not, don't think about the agile as development uh, met methodology, but more as a agile of a actual words of it. The last thing I want to talk about real quick is that, you know, environments, configuration, infrastructure, and all these things that we did not fit into uh, all the other uh, four things. And this is a very important th thing. But first thing first, I really, really want to say another important thing to you. And if there are, like, when I say, like, this is super important, this are all the things I want you to come out with from this talk and keep it in the back of your heads. Mine's uh, is that, like, one of them was, well, Please do delete features, uh, feature toggles that you're not using. The other one that is very important is do not do click ops. If you know what click ops is, you probably know what you should not be doing. If you don't, well, it's, it means that when you're setting up your application in whatever you're using, Kubernetes, whatever, do not go into UI interface and they'll go wizard, click, click, clicks, next, 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 finish, deploy, done. Because next time you're going to be deploying that thing, five years later, you're not going to Remember what you did. You're not the UI will have cha would have changed and all this kind of stuff. Do write uh, infrastructure and co as code to deploy your applications. Codify those things so you can actually do versioning of this and you can put that into a uh, version control as well. So why do you need to automate this instead of doing uh, click ops? Well. Uh, Obviously, there are some reason, good reasons for that. There are some cons as well, but we'll look at that. So pros, it's reproducible. You can always repeat the process and expect the same results. Given the same version, given the same version of everything, it will be the same results. If things change, well, then we get into the con part, which is that you need to update. If, if something changes and if your code stops, your deployment code stops working, you will need to update it. It, needs, it still needs maintenance and stuff like that, right? The other good thing for automating all this and creating as uh, infrastructure as code and all that, it's actually documented. You can think of it as a documentation. You don't really need to write text. You can just say, hey, this is my infrastructure, infrastructure code, and I use that as a documentation. This is how you do it. And well, obviously, the last one is kind of the captain obvious to the rescue. It's well, it's automated. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to um, provide, uh, you know, you don't have to spend your uh, valuable hours and time to actually do it manually, hand by hand, all the time. Um, so, how do you automate this kind of stuff? So, environment deployments, configuration deployments, and infrastructure, and all these things. Well, obviously, there are different ways of uh, different products as well to do infrastructure as code kind of things. So, you can do Terraform, Pulumi, and all the other ones that are out there. Like, you know, there are uh, forks from uh, the products and that's been uh, created, and so on, so on, so on, right? Uh, you probably have heard the whole thing. But anyway, if not, Look at it. Have a look and look at the different uh, different alternatives for infrastructure as code. Uh, another thing is that you can also do config, and config is uh, actually another package that can be provided to you if you're using MicroProfile. There's something called MicroProfile config, but there are a bunch of other ones that are uh, out there as well that do 
provide configuration where you can actually go into properties file and do that. And they have also hierarchy of property files. So you have one per application, one per environment, one per whatever. And then there are like, uh, they have this hierarchy that keeps on overloading each other depending on uh, which of those property files exists and where it exists and which has more uh, importance than the other ones and so on, so on, so on. When it comes to infrastructure, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to tell you that you what you need to do is to think about how you want to do that. You want to go infrastructure as a service. You want to go uh, platform as a service. Uh, you want to do serverless. You want to go uh, you want to go old school, you want to create a VM and just deploy things there, maybe you have to. Maybe maybe that's your uh, stack that is forcing you to do that. But maybe you want to go Kubernetes. Maybe you want to go uh, K80 or, you know, things like that. It's your mileage might vary, your reasoning might vary, might vary, but like most of the times you don't need just pure Kubernetes. If you have a tiny little app, don't do that. Look at other options, look at the pricing, look at how much it will cost you in resources, in money, and all these kind of things, and also look at your needs. Do you really need like three node monstrosity running Kubernetes and uh, all this stuff just for a tiny little app for your cat to say hi to you while you're at work or something like that? Right? If you have many cats, maybe you need a Kubernetes cluster for that. You know, they're all talkative and all want to say hi to you. But, you know, if you have so many cats that you have a Kubernetes cluster, you probably have another issue as well, uh, like, you know, with managing all the cats and managing all your applications. Well, let's not go there. It's getting, getting late in the evening, so I'm not going there. I'm getting off uh, the script. I did show you some demos already, but I can show you some more in, uh, in, in a second as well. So before I do that, um, I want to share the link. So this is the time to do screenshots of, this, uh, of, the, of, the, of the screen if you want to. So there is a source code of everything that has been sh I have been showing to you uh, uh, down at, at the bottom there. And if you want to find me on different various social media, I put all the links here at this site uh, and where you can basically find me on whatever you want, whatever you like, X, Twitter, Blue Sky, Mastodon, anything else that you want. And there is also a blog that I, I semi-regularly update with some information and stuff like that. So you'll, you'll see the, all the links basically here. So all the social media and stuff like that. Um, and like I said, the repository is public. It's here. Uh, it's on my GitHub, and it's called Five Features Talk Demo. Uh, so you'll see all the stuff that you, you have seen so far. It will also give you information how to set up things, where things are, and how it, everything is working. And um, uh, sometimes I'm using Podman. Sometimes I'm do using Docker Compose. It depends because I was actually running it on different platforms. but. Podman Compose, Docker Compose, they're supposed to be interchangeable, so you can actually use both of them. Right now, I'm using Docker with Colima at the bottom, so it's uh, it actually works with all this kind of uh, stuff. Um, right. I think I showed you quite a lot of things already, and, um, and uh, for some reason, backup message is not really returning me a... A response. I don't understand why. But anyway, all right. Uh, let's go into a. Oh, cool. You've actually been writing where you're joining from Canada, India. That's really nice. Italy. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah, great. It's, it's amazing. Uh, oh, I see Max is here as well. Nice. Gianluca. Cool. Really, really great to see you all, uh, folks. Do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? Do you want me? Anything specific they want me to talk about and show you a little bit more? I think I, I do believe we have one hour in total, so we have a few more minutes. I hope we're not you having do. 45 You're minutes. Absolutely... No, no, no. You are right on time, Rustam. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to thank you for the excellent presentation and just thank very, so very informative and interactive. Um, so just a, a quick uh, reminder for everybody in the audience, uh, please uh, 
feel free to ask the questions uh, in the Ask a Questions tab or drop them in um, the chat, whatever is yeah. most convenient for you. And I just wanted to, um, while we while we wait for some questions to come in, I just wanted to remind you that we're always looking to have some more Jakarta Tech Talks. Um, so we are looking for Q3 and Q4 Talks. So if you have uh, some interesting information uh, or presentation that you want to share with us exactly what Rustam has done today, um, please, I will provide you the link that you can fill out the form and send that over it. But uh, most importantly, we have a very, very, very big event that's happening. Um, it's our flagship event, previously known as EclipseCon, that is now called OCX. There is going yeah. to be a co-located event for Java. And so Call for Papers is open. We highly encourage anybody that has some talks that would like to submit some. Um, it is, we are doing the early bird uh, selection, I believe next Monday. Um, yeah. And then the final program will be uh, scheduled um, in the at the end of June. So we highly encourage everybody to go look that out. Um, and if you're not looking to do a talk, registrations will be open shortly as well. So you'll be able to register for this awesome event. I am telling you guys, it is going to be next level. <laughs> It's going to be it's really fun. Be really I did good. submit talks and you should too as well. It's really fun. Uh, and it's just look for OSX. Uh, OSX. Uh, OCX, yeah. OCX, sorry, sorry. OCX, yeah. Yeah, is that is, I think, yes, that's this correct. Is it. So that's the thing. And then when you go on the website, this is the main page that will hit you. And then you can actually submit the talk and, and, and also sign up for updates and stuff like that. So... Uh, the early bird, like uh, like you said, is thirty first uh, for 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 first round of submissions. So please do submit some stuff. It's gonna be fun. It'll be great. I don't see any questions in the chat or the ask a questions tab. Just great people um, joining us from everywhere, like you mentioned around the world. So thank you so much again, Rustam. It's always thank a you pleasure having, having you me. join us. It's been a great and pleasure. You have yourself... Pleasure is always to be here, and it's pleasure is always to to talk to you all from all around the world and have a nice evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, when, whatever time of the day it is. And I really hope to see you soon at some point. And like I said, if there is any questions, just feel free to ping me offline, online, offline, or well, my DMs are open and uh, or public or whatever. Whatever you feel like, you should be able to find the contact information at, at my website. Beautiful. Thank you very much Thank for you having so, me. Thank you so much, everyone. See you.